Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Tyson Yunkaporta. Hi, Jim. It's great to be back. Hey, yeah, great to have you back. Uh, for our listeners, this is part two. We recorded another episode about uh, a week ago, and the conversation got so dense and so interesting, we both agreed that, hey, we couldn't do justice to the conversation without doing a part two. So here we are with part two. A little background on Tyson. He's an academic, an arch critic, and a researcher who is a member of the Appalach clan in far northern Queensland. And for you people who don't know about Australia, that's kind of in the upper right of Australia, I think, if I got that right. You know, up as in uh, north being top, which is, of course, a very Western way of thinking <laughs> about the world. Sometimes you want to look at the map the other, other way around. But that's anyway, right. that's where he comes from. Not only does he do all this kind of uh, academic stuff, but he also carves traditional tools, which we'll talk about, and weapons, and also works as a lecturer in indigenous knowledge at Deakin University in Melbourne. He lives in Melbourne. As in part one, we're going to at least loosely root the discussion around uh, Tyson's new book called Sand Talk. And I got to tell you, this is about the most interesting book I've read in a couple of years with respect to trying to understand where we should go as a society. I've now finished reading the book about 10 days ago. I read it carefully, annotated it, and have been thinking about it. And I would even say I have been marinating myself in it for the last 10 days. And this is an odd feeling, but I can feel it almost in my DNA now that it's trying to speak to me and tell me something that I have never known. (laughs) And I've been working on this thing called Game B with some friends and associates of mine for several years. We're trying to think about how to build a society for the West uh, that can actually endure and not self-terminate and can provide a way better quality of life for people and an ethical way of living. And it's really hard to get there from Western civilization, tell you the truth. And this book is calling to me. The the clouds haven't cleared. I don't see the beautiful horizon, but I truly feel that what Tyson's talking about here is drawing me forward to how we really think about transitioning from Western civilization, which is on a death spiral, frankly, to something that's both sustainable and wonderful. Mm. And I really can't put my finger on it any more precisely than that. Yeah. You go forward into more clouds. That yeah. <laughs> there's just more clouds. I haven't seen that beautiful horizon yet. <laughs> yeah, I think it's there. God damn it! I mean, that's my it's hope. It's got to be there. Yeah, it's got to be there. But it's not easy. I'm telling you, people, read this goddamn book. This book will change how you think if you take it seriously. And it it is really a serious book. It will do amazing things to your head. So just read the goddamn book. All right. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> it is just a, it's a neural adventure, isn't it? It really is. And it yeah. sticks with you. I mean, you know, I, the damn thing, dwell, I just dwell on it. I really do. And I go back and think about the examples you give, which are from all over the place. I mean, talk about multi-perspective. I mean, he, you know, the book uses complexity science as a, as a strong lens. Things we talked about last time. The book has uh, complexity or complex 77 times in it. I'm a bit of a quant nerd on text. I have some tools to let me analyze it. And yet it also looks back from, you know, at least 50,000 years of history from the uh, indigenous uh, Australian perspective. And it's quite interesting how the two perspectives often provide the same answer, which is just uncanny, tell you the truth. (laughs) As I said last time, all your transcripts together would probably have at least 76 motherfuckers in it. As well. Oh, way more than that. Way more. <laughs> yeah. I think I got at least one that probably has that many. Yeah, we'll add a zero to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 and that's despite the fact that I have so far eschewed talking about game A politics on the show. Yeah. If I ever do that, I'll definitely break 76 in the, uh, you know, in the first episode. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's funny that it never comes in with the talk about hard forks and the Dunbar number. You know, <laughs> you know they talk about all oh, your defectors and your this and that, but they they never quite get down to the, the politics and the polarization that happens. And that's by design, frankly. That you know, in our game B conversations and a lot of and what I do on my podcast, I want to get a, beyond all that team red, team blue, at least in the U.S. vernacular. Yeah, because they're both wrong, right? The the real answer is not even close to either one. So why should we deplete our emotional energy lining up in teams and fighting over what's not even close to the, the way forward? So mm. that's my perspective on it. And that's why I resist the temptation, at least in, with my game A hat on, I mean, my game B hat on, uh, to be dragged into those conversations. Now, with my game B hat, anyone who follows me on Facebook knows that I uh, bash a certain stupid ass incumbent in the United States on a regular basis. But we're not going to talk about that today, are we? No. All right. No, but I do want one of those Game B hats. Do you have a merch thing happening? You need to get a store up. Yeah, uh, we do. We don't have one yet. I mean, All right. They, you know, and the issue is there is no Game B organization. It's you know radically decentralized. Of course, that means that anyone who wants to could set up a store, but uh, there yeah, is no true. official Game B anything, which is kind of part of its charm. Mm. Anyway, before we uh, get back into the details of the book, I'd love to have you chat a little bit about uh, a theme that comes in every chapter, which is the wooden artifacts of various sorts that you make. You know, I also do a little woodworking, I'm sure not nearly as cool as yours. You know, tell me a little bit about you and woodworking and why it was important to you to spend a you know, fair amount of time talking about the woodworking you did while you were writing each chapter. Yeah, well, the, the woodworking is the center of my like uh, cognitive process and my cognitive world and, and also uh, so describing that that web of relations of neural relations around that that explains better this idea of what the mind is and what my theory of mind is because that's that's how I do all my my cognitive work is through that you know I mean I've got to cut different kinds of woods for different kinds of implements from different many different places in exactly the right season you know or it'll go wrong and I've got to have an association with that plant, that species as well. Um, and I have to understand the story and where that story goes, like a map in the land. So uh, uh, songs, the, these song lines through the landscape we talked about, that is like a, a big cognitive map of the landscape. So you have these inner landscapes as well, you know, in your mind and you're traveling them and connecting up all these stories. And eventually they web all the way across the, continent just intersecting so you're sitting right at the middle of this you know so some of the thing i think i describe in one I, that i've made two boomerangs that are split from the same tree yeah it was a beefwood tree and i can't pick those up without sort of almost being in that place and no matter how far apart those boomerangs are they're still connected it's that uh, what do they call that in quantum physics when you got those two particles entanglement entanglement i'm doing like Boomerang entanglement here, <laughs> yeah. but everything's entangled, you know. So the place where I cut those is 3,000 kilometers away from where I am now, and I'm still entangled with that place. And, you know, if I pick them up, those boomerangs, if I pick them up, I'm going to pick them up now and see what happens. But, you know, if I'm holding them in, in my hands, it's, I just go into a different place. So I'm there. You know, and I'm standing and I can see the tree. Ah, oh, yeah. And when I uh, clap those together, it's it kind of really animates them and animates my mind and takes me to that place and I can see the tree, the beefwood tree. It's got these little sort of these split hard nuts that you can use as clothes pegs. Um, and there's a nut inside there that you can eat as well. That's medicinal. It smells like, uh, it smells amazing, the wood. You know it's going to do you good. So it's got a lot of different properties, this tree. But I'm looking right out and, you know, across, it's just up from a swamp area, like a tea tree swamp. And, of course, straighter then, the way then, I think, you know, mother side has a totemic connection to the, those tea trees. But then that swamp's like a scary place there's like um people you know if people are doing sorcery that they, they'll sneak off there and do that kind of thing so you got to be careful there and then there's these uh two brothers these yochi yochi these sort of 
weird spirit things that that sort of sneak around in the swamp there as well. So there's that story, and it just goes on and on. But then I see the imbalances. So there's termite mounds there, but the termite mounds are oversized, and they look beautiful, and you know tourists take photos of them. But it breaks my heart because I can see that that means the place is sick. Because when the termite mounds get too big, you know it's out of balance. And I know that the golden-shouldered parrot that used to nest in there is extinct now, just in the last couple of decades. You know, and it's extinct because um, there's a moth. There used to be a moth that's gone now, that lays its eggs in the nest of the golden-shouldered parrot that has its nest inside the termite termite mound, because it's a perfectly regulated temperature in there. And then the moth eggs and the bird eggs hatch at the same time, and so as the birds are growing up, the larvae is eating the shit of those baby birds. If that's not happening, then the baby birds just drown in their own shit in that hole in the, the termite nest, and so that's what's happened. And they live for a you know fifty years or something, so nobody really noticed. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, those parrots were gone, and then there's an imbalance there, and everything's going wrong, and. And so the whole place gets sick and the termite mounds are getting, you know, oversized and everything's going wrong, you know. And then there's a tree nearby that it's supposed to get red flowers on it, you know, in a particular season. And when the red flowers come, you know that it's time to get go and collect oysters because that, that means the oysters are fat. And that tr- those trees haven't flowered for about five years. And the oysters haven't been getting fat for about five years. You know, everything's going really wrong there. There's, um, you know, a lot of bauxite mining happening there. And, you know, there's a lot of imbalances and people sort of look at it like untouched wilderness, but you can see that it's dying, you know? Yeah, very interesting. And that's one of the things I noticed throughout the book is that when you have, when you're using the indigenous lens, the knowledge is connected to physical representations. I mean, if we use the Western terminology, we could say they're mnemonics, but I suspect it's actually a lot deeper than that. Yeah. Well, so when I'm composing, like always before I write something, I'll carve something first and I'll carve it in. It's it's a haptic cognition act, you know. Um, you have that haptic cognition where the tool is the extension of your, of your arm and then the other tool that you're making your knowledge, the things you're thinking through and the things you're composing are going into that wood as you carve it, you know, and then you go one step further and actually etch those designs into the wood as well as a further mnemonic thing. It's adding another visual layer to it. So, you know, all the entire book is, a you know, I'm looking at a pile of tools there now. That's the actual book. And that would be like more than Karl Marx. There's a lot of volumes there, you know. So the, you know, the book Sand Talk itself, I'm just translating fragments from each of those tools into that. Uh, But there's a lot more to it as well. Yeah, so it's this, uh, with this cognition, there are terabytes of information there and they're in this landscape, these maps you carry around, you know, because memory is navigational, you know, uh, cognitively speaking. Navigation and story are the two main, main tools we use as human beings for memory. And so we have that mnemonic of the the sky. The sky is reflecting the land. So the night sky is also a map of the landscape, wherever you are. And as the stars move around, they tell you different stories of what's happening in different seasons in the landscape. You know, so you get those cycles of time happening there. And so you've got those maps reflecting each other. Um, so there's terabytes of knowledge that are recorded in the stars as well. You know, so that's a vast infinite text yeah i love that so you know i i guess if you if you're talking about if you're trying to put together ideas about you know an ideal society and you're basing this in evolutionary theory and you're postulating things about well what cavemen did it's worth consulting or looking at um the complexity of paleolithic cultures and the cognition uh within paleolithic cultures are still existing cultures looking at those to look at the kind of complexity you got there. Because if you're just imagining a modern human dropped back in that context, then all you're going to get is flight or fight and um, uh, the fittest survive and all that kind of weirdness. And and so you're going to end up with a flawed model right from the start. 
Yeah that's, yeah, that's what I was talking about, the DNA calling to me, that there is something deeper and richer than anything we've experienced in our Western, at least my, I shouldn't talk, speak for you because you've experienced both, uh, in my Western kind of flat culture, right? And it's uh, a known fact from physical anthropology that the civilized man's brain is actually smaller by about 10% than the earlier man, those still modern humans' brains, say from yeah. 30 or 40,000 years ago, including in you know, most of this research was in Europe, the so-called Cro-Magnon man, because mm. uh, our lives were way more complex than it was hard. You talk a bit about the snowman who was found up in the Alps, right? Oh, yeah, the Iceman. Yeah, the Iceman, the Iceman. And wow, you know, considering that they had very minimal technologies at the day, the Iceman was astoundingly well prepared for life in an extreme environment. He was, but he was kind of on that cusp. And he was very, very sick, uh, like already sort of poisoned from this emerging industrial and, and agricultural culture that he was involved with. A lot of evidence there. So he, he was full of arsenic from the bronze forge, you know, because he'd obviously been forging weapons at a, at a, at a forge and that, that that was a highly toxic process that had poisoned him horribly. He was riddled with arsenic. He also had Lyme disease. Hmm. You know, Lyme disease tells me that while they were probably still doing a bit of hunting and gathering, they'd stopped caring for their land properly. <laughs> the ticks that you get, they, they, they're not out of control if you're looking after the, the country properly, if you're looking after the land. Yeah, if you have birds on the land. Yeah. You know, ground birds will take care of your tick problem. And even like, you know, burning off areas if they're, they're too scrubby and that there's too much fuel load. Um, if for some reason, like perhaps you've come into that place and displaced some of the megafauna that usually eats that, then you don't want to let that fuel load build up. Because for a start, you end up with, you know, <laughs> massive bushfires in Greenland or whatever that, you know, had earlier this year. I mean, yeah, like once you get rid of the megafauna, you, you really, like the really big megafauna, then you really do need to be taking care of that fuel load and burning off. Uh, and that'll also take care of your ticks. Oh, that's a good point. It's an interesting little, just an aside, you, I don't know, you probably know this, you know everything about, it seems like in this area. But when we look at the energy consumption of uh, societies in general, They've been increasing over time until finally they're extremely high at the uh, you know advanced civilization, so-called. But the uh, Aboriginal people are actually an exception to that rule. If you include the use of fire to control the land, the Aboriginal people were almost as high as Western civilization in terms of the amount of energy that they used. Yeah, I mean, that and oh, so many things, that so many... Um just symbioses that you, you put yourself in in that interaction with the landscape when you belong to it, you know, when you're part of it. Like, I, I don't think there's anybody. So in, in my family's community, there's, you know, everyone's always in the river and it's full of crocodiles, but I, I've never, ever heard of someone being taken by a crocodile there, you know. And, I mean, until very recently... Until about the 1950s, the custom was to take the haircut of, of a male child, the first haircut they had as a, as a baby, and do that. And you'd cut that hair in that uh, crocodile nesting season. So then you catch a baby crocodile and you tie the hair around the baby crocodile's head and let it go. And the same way you're talking about feeling changes in your DNA, that would make a, um, an entanglement, I guess a kind of, uh, if not quantum, then molecular entanglement between that man as he grew and that crocodile as he grew. And that would be that man's crocodile. And he could go down to the river and call the crocodile and he'd come up. And so that man could go swimming in the river and wouldn't have to worry about sharks, crocodiles, anything else. That crocodile would help him and they would hunt together. And I know that sounds like an apocryphal tale, but there are photos of this still all around the world because um, the missionaries... They used to get international tourists coming there and then they'd get all the men in the town to run down to the river and call their crocodiles and jump in and hold up the crocodiles' tails in the river and all the tourists would take photos. So that's something that definitely happened. <laughs> Although it doesn't happen anymore, which is a, a shame really. 
Yeah, it's, uh, that, that is, shows how closely integrated your people were with the land. You know, they could yeah. see the patterns, right? And they did their rituals to reinforce those patterns. Yeah. And so hunt, hunting with a crocodile takes a lot less energy, if you know what I mean. You know, if, if you're catching very big fish that are about the size of a 10-year-old child <laughs> with your crocodile companion, it, it makes hunting a lot easier. There's, there's a lot of things like that that have just been, they, they seem like, you know, superhero powers now. Those are the things you need to survive in a tough environment for, you know, tens of thousands of years in equilibrium with your environment. Yeah. But then also if that environment is incredibly abundant and you're managing it properly, then it isn't a harsh environment. I mean, it's a harsh environment to try and survive in now because, you know, 50% of everything's dead in it. So it is quite hard to um, scrape together <laughs> enough food out there. You know, it is harsh to try and survive there now. But, you know, back in the day, it was incredibly abundant and you only needed to do about two hours of work a day and then that was that was it. The rest was for um, the important things in life. Yeah, that's a, that's something we'll get to a little later. That that issue of yeah, uh, why the hell are we working so hard on things that are like just total bullshit, right? Yeah. But first, I want to jump back into some actual words from your book, which I think tee up the discussion in an interesting way, and this overlaps a bit with our discussion from last time in a little bit more general terms. And this is uh, Emu is a troublemaker who brings into being the most destructive idea in existence. I am greater than you. You are less than me. This is the source of all human misery. Aboriginal society has designed over thousands of years to deal with this problem. Some people are just idiots, and everyone has a bit of idiot in them from time to time, coming from some deep place inside that whispers, you are special. You are greater than other people and things. You are more important than everything and everyone. All things and all people exist to serve you. This behavior needs massive checks and balances to contain the damage it can do. Containing the excesses of malignant narcissists is a team effort. Mm. Well, I mean, the entire Australian Aboriginal society basically was designed over millennia to deal with that problem. And I think in any, you know, game B, kind community, really that's what you have to deal with first. You have to design everything around. <laughs> so everything from your social norms, you know, uh, to your just different cultural expressions, to your rules, to your kinship, to all of your structures, your institutions, everything has to be designed to check narcissism. Even the language you speak, every, everything <laughs> has got to be um, holding that in check and has got to be punishing it harshly as soon as it appears, but not punishing it in a nasty way, but in a, a way that's designed to transform you, uh, the transgressor, and everybody else that's involved in the punishment as well. Everybody learns, everybody transforms. We discussed that, uh, yeah, that sort of criminology of that last time. We did go into the criminology stuff yeah. last time. And some narcissism is the thing. You know, it is that, uh, that seed. And you know that the emu story... You know, at the start of creation, all the stories talk about that emu and, and he's often, or she <laughs> as well, is uh, is often, you know, that one who's making that mess, that first one who has that, that I'm, oh, look at me, look at me, I'm the best. You know, I should be the boss of everybody. You know, so it's that first injunction against people seeking to be the boss or to place themselves over. And what blows me away is that, you know, the traditional symbol you know, the sand talk symbol. So, you know, what you draw in the sand or, or paint on, on a rock wall or whatever, uh, the symbol for that is, is exactly the same as the mathematical greater than sign. <laughs> That's quite interesting. It's just, right? uh, yeah, I just uh, thought that was an amazing little uh, congruence happening there. You know, that the mathematical greater than sign is also the sign for this, this being who, you know, invented that first malicious thought that's the source of all human misery. Man, that goes all the way back. And one of my favorite books, people listen to the podcast have heard me mention it before, but it makes exactly the same point about other cultures mm. called Hierarchy in the Forest, The Evolution uh, yeah. of Egalitarian Behavior by Chris Bohm. Yeah. And he does an amazing job of looking at numerous forager societies, pre-agricultural societies. And he discovers something very interesting that 
all of them that survive any length of time, and he, he admits that probably a bunch didn't, developed cultural methods to suppress big men, basically. Mm. Right? And he also then looks at the genetic record and behaviors of our chimp and bonobo ancestors, both of whom are way more hierarchical than humans are at, at their hunter-gatherer, at their forager stages. And he essentially argues that forager level civilization was principally about bringing down people who thought they were greater than everybody else. Yeah. And, uh, and that that's a worldwide pattern for all societies that existed for any extended period of time. But then at the same time, so in our cultures, you do provide for that because sometimes you have emergent situations or projects that come out that demand some kind of a hierarchy, temporary hierarchy. And you know, we talk about that in the Game B world, word we use. I'd love to hear how it, re how it relates to the language that your people use. Uh, we distinguish between role-based leadership and position-based leadership. Yeah. You know, position-based leadership is, hey, I'm the manager of the butt-fucking department or something, and I organize all the <laughs> butt-fucking over all time, whether I know anything about butt-fucking or not, right? <laughs> While uh, role-based leadership would be, hmm, you know, uh, we're going on a difficult hunt against a mammoth here. And Tyson is the biggest, baddest <laughs> mammoth hunter in the group and knows the most about it. Somebody's going to butt fuck that mammoth. Exactly. <laughs> so and Tyson's the only guy crazy enough to do it. So Tyson's so he's in charge, in charge. <laughs> for the mammoth butt fucking <laughs> expedition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's role-based leadership. Yeah. And when the butt fucking is done, he's no longer the leader. He, he, yeah. had a, he, had a, he was the man for the job. So uh, by acclamation, uh, he's the leader. We all listen to him till the job's done. Yeah. It, it's, it's all contextual. So, I mean, everything's contextual in our culture. It's like the dynamic subordination I hear you talking about. And, you know, the Navy SEALs do it and they have to do it in an instant. You know, no matter how many stripes you've got on your shoulder back on the ship, you know, when you're in action, you need to be able to change, you know, as the terrain changes, as the weather changes, you know, like, you know, it might start snowing. And then so suddenly, well, Jim, you you take point, you <laughs> will listen to you because you're the snowscape dude. And that's the way it goes. You know, you've got to be able to switch in the moment. Yep. Particularly because I was telling you about that sort of those kind of maps of the landscape you know, everybody has a role for speaking for different parts of that landscape within your territory. You know, so each family has places there. So a side of the river that, that they speak for and that people uh, will need to ask their permission if they want to do things there or they will need to defer to that person, you know, when you're moving through that part of the river. But you might be on the other side of the river and that's, well, that's your uncle's side there. So, you know, you defer to him. And if he's not there then everybody in the group's going to defer to you because he's your uncle. And so you're inheriting that place from him. So you speak for that place and, um, you know, people will have to follow you. But then you move around the river bend and you go up the hill. Well, who speaks for those hills? Who has that story? And uh, so on and so forth. So as you move across the landscape, you're constantly shifting in your uh, leadership roles, dynamic subordination. It's all drawn back to the, the physical and again, that's such a interesting and different way of, of organizing the collective knowledge. Mm. Yeah. The other, other thing I wanted to probe into a little bit about collective knowledge is you many times reference uh, your interactions with elders. Mm. And you even confess that, you know, due to your own personal autobiography, you were never, never went through the manhood ritual. So in terms of hierarchy in the you know, elderness, not really yeah. hierarchy. It's a different kind of relationship. I'd love you to talk about that. You're still a 13 year old kid, right? Yeah. And so what is an elder and how does, how does that elderhood work and how would you distinguish it between Western style position based leadership or, mm. you know, the boss of the butt fuckers uh, mm. organizes mm. all the butt fucking, even if he doesn't know anything about it. Right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because that, that elderhood, you know, we've kind of taken that on board, but it's kind of something that's been mapped over, you know, most cultures that have been uh, colonized. So you'll see it in India, you'll see it, you know, even with your uh, African slave descendants, you know, in America, all that sort of stuff, you know, they're always called Uncle Tom or Auntie this, and it's the same in, <laughs> in India. There's this kind of, this idea of elderhood that's Western that's been imposed on the top. 
and a lot of people have, have started sort of have really internalized that model. But it is a lot more dynamic than that. Like you don't just become an elder when you reach a certain age and weight. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, that would just be positional authority again. You know, you don't do that. You know, the people who have shown that they have that discipline, that they can suppress their narcissism and really, really reach those higher levels of knowledge. And, you know, knowledge is our capital, you know, and you don't get to accumulate it unless you pass every test along the way. There's also positional things. So I'm a younger sibling. And so that's my older brother. He's the one who speaks for all that knowledge. And, and I don't speak for that as a younger sibling. Uh, also, as somebody who hasn't been initiated, you know, that, that makes uh, things different as well, especially when I go around with other groups. But most people, you know, a lot of people my age and younger, most are not initiated now anyway, because that's not happening anymore. Now, why not? I mean, I, when we think yeah. about Game B, one of the things that we're softly specifying in what comes next is there mm. needs to be these initiations, particularly on that step from adulthood. Yeah. And it probably ought to be a hell of a lot younger than 21 or 18 yeah. even. Well, look, in, for most of the continent, that it, it stopped happening because you, you get shot or whipped or you'd have your children taken away or you'd be uh, thrown in a truck and moved to the other side of the continent if you participated in any cultural rituals of that kind. You know, so they were illegal for a long time, right up until, you know, very recently. Uh, so for a lot of people, it was because of that. But for my family's community, that's a, um, a swimming pool was built on the initiation ground a few decades ago. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so that that uh, that was it, and that's the first stage initiation right there. So as soon as that was built there, that that was that tradition was finished. That's too bad. So no young men can go through those uh, those ceremonies anymore. But it's it's sort of shifted. We adapt. Now it's um, jail is the rite of passage uh, for young men. You know, um, you go to jail and strangely enough, when you're in jail, you learn a lot of cultural <laughs> things. You know, there's workshops and you, you learn to do indigenous art and you, you do lots of dancing and all that sort of thing. And um, you, you know, learn other criminal sort of activities and become a bit of a gangster and then then you're unleashed back into the world. So that's the rite of passage now uh, for a lot of men. It doesn't sound, sound like it's necessarily the, the best. Yeah, it's not the best, but you adapt to, you know, use whatever you've got, what's available to you, I guess. But, uh, yeah, so there are, you know, it's not really a hierarchy. It's just that you, you there's a lot of secret and very sacred knowledge that can't just be thrown around for anybody. You know, so you have keepers of that knowledge who only earn the right to keep that knowledge through being very dedicated throughout their life uh, towards that. And, you know, you have to go through different stages of initiation every 15 years to get the next layer. It's like, you know, getting your um, high school diploma and then getting your, you know, your bachelor degree and then then doing your honors and then or a master's and then doing a doctorate and then doing postdoctorate work. It's pretty much the same as that. If you don't have the tools to take on that knowledge or the right personality traits, then you're not going to get it. But then it doesn't matter if you don't get it anyway, because you're still a highly valued member of the group anyway. Nobody's above you and no one's below you uh, because you're not special. And that's what you learn in that first initiation, which I've, un I've gone through the early stages of that now. Yeah, in, in, I had to go to another place to start doing that. But yeah, what, what you come out from that with is a strong sense that you are not special. But then at the same time, nobody else is that special either. You know, but that you all belong to something special. Yeah, damn near the center of the issue. Uh, in fact, another quote from the book is, perhaps the transferable wisdom here is simply that most young men need something a little meatier than mindfulness workshops to curtail <laughs> the terrifying narcissism that overtakes them from the moment their balls drop. Absolutely. Every male at, thir at 13, 14... <laughs> maybe even 12, uh, you know, pretty much needs to be uh, isolated <laughs> into a very different group of people and should not uh, be emerging until they're <laughs> uh, 18, 19 or something like that. Yeah. yeah, some of the most destructive people on the planet, 15-year-old uh, boys. Some of the most interesting <laughs> too, right? I like, I always said if I ever was, were to teach school, I would take on 
you know, eighth graders uh, or ninth graders, you know, 14, 13, 14, 15 years old, yeah. you know, there's something real about them, right? Yeah. At least there was, you know, from what they're trying to do to kids in our American schools, at least they're, you know, they're, they're trying to break them, right? You can't do anything anymore. You'll call the police yeah. if you get into a little fist fight. What the fuck, right? Yeah, that's it. That's another quote in the book is if you want to find the next generation of great thinkers, you look in the detention room of any high school. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You always think of that life as sweaty and meaty, real life, right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, it pisses off the powers that be. And then sort of finish up on this idea of I am greater than you, you tie that back to a Christian myth and you call it the Luciferian lie. You know, again, Lucifer, Satan, yeah. uh, at least in the later stories uh, that are told, there's a little bit in the Bible, but a lot of it was stuff written in, the, in medieval times that allegedly, uh, you know, Satan came about when the greatest angel rebelled against God, saying that I'm greater than you. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, and then and then he fell. Is and there's always this idea of the fall of man, and every culture has its its mythology around that. You know, even Cain and Abel, that was about that. You know, with the first people, and I guess even the original sin, Garden of Eden, all that sort of thing. Um, all these things are always about that moment of narcissism, of of thinking that you can be greater than you are, greater than, you know, um, other things around you that you could have knowledge over, dominion over, um, all these kinds of things. Now, there's an interesting part of Cain and Abel that most people didn't notice in the story. Mm. Abel was a herdsman of sheep, while Cain was a dirt farmer. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's it too. <laughs> yeah, very few people notice that in the story. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, pastoralism is sustainable with that kind of thing, you know, shepherds and flocks, um, you know, maintaining grasslands in perpetuity like that. It's, um, yeah, pastoralism is is a way of life that can be sustainable. But yeah, that intensive agriculture, that's um, that's always been a bad idea. And one of the problems, of course, is it locks you into owning a particular parcel of land. This is yeah. mine, right? And yeah. my, my square of land is greater than yours. So we get back to this greater than issue again. Yeah. Yeah. So though it is possible, and there are and there are societies that have organized the use of land in a much more commons oriented approach, and I think, do think that's a an approach that's worth thinking about in the future. Is you know, how can we become commoners on the land, even if we are still stuck doing agriculture for a while because of the number of people that we have? Ah, the penny just dropped on the origin, possibly, of the word commoners. You know, aristocrats used to refer to, refer to peasants as commoners, didn't they? They did. They did. That's yeah, and maybe it's because they were working the commons. Ah, I had not um, thought of that. That is a very interesting thought. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up on that after the after the show and see if those two can uh, can yeah. get together. I recently did a uh, podcast. I think it'll be out on Monday, maybe, with Michelle Bowens of the P2P Foundation. And he is uh, one of the biggest promoters of the idea of the commons and that the commons is what we have lost and what we need to regain. And I think mm -hmm. that's going to be part, part of thinking about what comes next. may not be the only way. Yeah. We live in a more complicated and complex world. And we'll get to the distinction between complicated and complex here in a minute or two. Because you do have- oh, It's way, way too complicated. There, there's somewhere in Melbourne, we walked past the other day and we saw that it was a commons that, uh, you know, a community had set up behind a big fence with um, <laughs> chains and padlocks on it. And it just looked beautiful in there. And so we're walking along with the kids and we're, ah, can we- come in and have a look at this. No, they wouldn't let us in. <laughs> so, well, you know, I think right there, your commons are not commons. And what you created is a closed system, you bastards. And we know what happens in closed systems. Yeah. Entropy. Yeah. yeah, I hope your zucchinis fall off the bloody vine. <laughs> Second law, thermodynamic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah. In a book with a lot of it. Pestilence yeah. on yeah. your commons, you... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that should be a warning to people who think that they're commoners, right? If your systems aren't open, in fact, you know, Eleanor Ostrom does talk about that. You know, the systems have to be open. But on the other hand, and this will come back to the management of the commons, you know, my argument is you have to have a semi-permeable membrane, right? The people who have the commons mm. have to allow things in and out. Yeah. But they need to have, you know, make some socially informed decisions about what passes through, right? Mm. You know, for instance... No sociopaths would be my rule inside my commons, and that we'd have some means to keep them out. 
because uh, if you don't, the Raiders are going to come and steal your zucchinis, yeah. whether they're healthy or not. You know, attempt to say all is fully open to all is probably not correct. I mean, that's not how any complex system works. Any complex system that manages to get any real level of complexity has membranes around it, but they're not closed. Yeah. They're closed, as you, as you point out quite brilliantly. Uh, then the second law of thermodynamics rules, and basically it's just headed for the shit pile either sooner or later. Uh, but if you're open, uh, you exchange energy and material with the outside world and information. Yeah. And so long as the outside world has fluxes of energy and matter that are way larger than your container, uh, then you can go on inside your container forever. Yeah, that's it. But um, I don't know. You might utilize your sociopaths too. There's another thing. I mean, they've got to have some um, useful and generalizable skills. You know, so, I mean, they can uh, do all the butchering, for example. So, as long as you – because they have that special gift where they can gut something without even their heart rate going up, you know. So, that's pretty good. You So, you've got someone in, in the community who's not going to, you know, be being traumatized by, by having to butcher an animal. So, you get them to do that work. And then I guess if a true psychopath comes through, then you send your sociopath after him. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> saying, We're going to need you to take that guy out. <laughs> Yeah, and then they'd feel they'd feel highly valued uh, <laughs> for their sociopathy, and um, and they might be content with that. You just don't let them near the kids. Yeah, that is that's interesting. That is one of the arguments, actually. You know, sociopathy seems to be about one percent of the population worldwide in most cultures. And one of the arguments is why has it uh, lasted? And the answer is it does have some utility, perhaps in war. I hadn't thought of the one about uh, dealing with uh, otherwise uh, emotionally disturbing work like slaughter. Though I've slaughtered so damn many deer over the years that I got over my squeamishness, probably about number five or six, something yeah. like that. But certainly initially it was, it took a lot of emotional energy to get yourself to do it. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And pro- probably a sociopath would be better at that. Yeah. Well, you'd, you'd want him on the walls, you know, like uh, <laughs> he's a sociopath, sure, but he's our sociopath. Yeah. Well, of course, one of the disturbing things about Western Civ, which I talk about regularly on the show, is that if, you know, probably only 1% of people in the West are sociopaths, maybe a little more because of the fucked up of our way of life. But in positions of authority, it's way higher than that. Mm. My estimate, having played at pretty high levels in corporate America, on Wall Street, and even in the White House when I was young, is at sort of the C-level suites in corporate America, I'd say 10% of those people are sociopaths. Yeah. And it's really dangerous to let sociopathy get control of levers in role-based leadership. Mm. I mean, not role-based, in position-based leadership. Yeah, that's why you have to have checks and balances throughout your culture, throughout your language, throughout all your institutions. Yeah. All at every level, you've got to have those checks and balances. And that's, like I said, that's a team effort. And as you said earlier, we talked about a little bit in passing, but I just remembered it from the book, is that the elders, one of their superpowers that they develop is to detect narcissistic behavior in mm. people and to refuse to deal with them while they're showing the narcissistic behavior. Yeah, that's it. And how frustrating for a sociopath if they can't gain access to the, the social goods, to the to the capital of your, your culture, which is knowledge, you know, and because, and you know, sociopaths always want to do well. They always want to rise. So, you know, they're going to have to really hold that in check if they ever want to have access to that knowledge, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, they'll just, um, no sociopath wants to be a child forever. Indeed. That basically highlights a potential control mechanism. All right. Uh, we have our sociopaths at 1% and they have some utility, but how do we keep them away from the lovers of power? Maybe one of the ways is that those who hold the wisdom refuse to pass it on Yeah, when they detect sociopathy Yeah, or they pass on a special useful for sociopaths. Mm. <laughs> and, and also just make sure that there are many, many le- levers of power and they're widely distributed throughout the group. And that they're transient, you know, I would argue. Yeah, uh, transient. Yeah. yeah you, know, you, you know, as you said, you're on a journey and you're in your uncle's area for a part of it and you're in your grandfather's area for another part of it. And then you're out in the part where nobody has geographic authority. Yeah. And, you know, so, there's, so it's not one, one boss all the time that starts to dominate people. Well, let's see, what are we going to talk about next? One of the later in my notes, but let's just talk about it now because I think it's related. And this is what you talk about in the book and that 
people in the area of complexity, applied complexity, talk about a fair amount, which is the distinction between complex and complicated. Yeah. Um, and and I, I've, I've heard a lot of, I mean, even just on your show, I've heard different people coming on with completely opposite views of which is which. You know, I've heard some people describe complexity as complicated and complicated as complex, you know, and I've heard you describe it as the difference between the dancer and the dance. Uh, No, that's between, I would call that is between reductionism and complexity. Right, right. A little little different distinction. The dancer is what you get from reductionism and the dance is complexity. Yeah. Well, to me, complicated is a system that is tinkered and that needs to be constantly tinkered with upgraded, you know, mended, you know, that it, it doesn't have that, that autopoiesis going on. It can't heal itself. It can't go through periods of, you know, homeostasis and hysteresis that it's just, you know, it's like this, this computer that we couldn't get to work at the start of the interview. And that's, I mean, <laughs> once it's stuffed, it's stuffed. That's it. <laughs> not like a boomerang that if it's not shaped quite right, you can uh, file it down a little bit until it is. Right? It's, it's not going to heal itself. It's just, you know, we just had to turn it off and turn it back on again. And I'm going to have to take it in, you know, to the shop now and get it fixed because it's playing up, you know, so they're going to have to update it and they're going to have to, you know, do all the other tinkery things that they need to do with all the ones and zeros to make it run properly. And, you know, to me, that's that's a complicated thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. The example I use for complicated versus complex, uh, I can actually have two. I'd love to get your reaction to it. One is a classic complicated system is an industrial farm, mm. you know, that involves pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, tractors, you know, hiring uh, armies of pickers in the picking season that you pay for with cash you know, taxes that you have to pay, bank loans, et cetera, like your computers, an intricate system. And if any one part fails significantly, you're fucked, Mm. right? Uh, As compared to, let's say, a woodlands, you know, where my farm is, for instance, until the chestnut blight came in the 1930s, brought from uh, elsewhere, these lands were amazingly rich in chestnuts. 50% of the trees were huge chestnut trees. Chestnuts are very rich in fatty nuts. Yeah. And they'd fall to the ground every fall. And they would be this amazing food for the deer. And even we had bison and elk in this eastern area prior to western agriculture appearing. And there are other food sources as well. There's acorns. That's the second biggest crop. And there's several different kinds. On our, Even today on our farm, we have 10 different kinds of oak trees. Mm. And some years the white oaks produce real well. Other years the red oaks. Some years the black oaks. Some years the chestnut oaks. And so there's no one solid failure mode. It's a robust system. And you have big game like deer and bear. We still have both. Mm. Uh, then you have smaller game like rabbits and uh, groundhogs. And, you know, in a, in a pinch, you could live off the rabbits and the groundhogs mm. and the squirrels if for some reason something well, happens. Well, the, uh, the pigs must like that too. Uh, fortunately, we don't have wild pigs here yet. Yeah. They tear the shit out of things. Yeah. But... And during settler time, uh, it was one of the interesting things. We did have a commons, and it was, in fact, we still have the legal basis for it. Our county is what's called a fence out county, which means if you don't want somebody else's animals on your land, it's your obligation to put up a fence to keep them out. Okay. And people are still, in theory, allowed to let their animals wander. And so in settler times, uh, they used to let the pigs out into this chestnut forests in the, every fall. And then they'd have to go round them up, you know, a couple of weeks later and they'd be big and fat. Let me tell Mm. you, after doing nothing but gorging on chestnuts for two or three weeks. But anyway, so the distinction between, you know, mature forest on one side and industrial agriculture on the other is, to my mind, a classic uh, distinction between complicated being the industrial farm and complex being a natural mature forest. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the complicated just can't be sustained. You know, there's this just this obsolescence in it that, you know, can't be denied. I guess it comes back to that entropy thing again. Yeah. I used to stand um, at a place, it was on a table land, and there was a road there. You could stand on the road and you could look on one side where the people who owned that, they'd cut down every single tree so that it was just pasture because they wanted to maximize the pasture. And it was a very, very thin pasture with some very skinny, sick looking sheep on it, you know, and uh, it was like a dust bowl there. It was just dead and dry. 
And then on the other side of the road, they'd left the trees in. So you had very big old growth trees there. And the pasture was magnificent, you know, because the trees are doing things there that bringing up and sharing nutrients. They're breaking up the rocks, you know, down deep and, and, and bringing up phosphorus and all kinds of things. You know, so the soil on one side of the road was beautiful and the pasture was very rich and the sheep were very fat. And then on the other side of the road, the sheep were sick and dying because of the tinkered, complicated bloody system they put there. And, you know, they're always out there spraying super phosphate, you know, around trying to coax some more life out of the dead ground. But, yeah, that ground was finished. Yeah, it's uh, very unfortunate what we've done with our soils uh, under cultivation. And it's been accelerating very, very rapidly since about 1950 uh, with exactly the things you're talking about, you know, the glyphosates, which produce for a while uh, high productivity because you get rid of the weeds. But unfortunately, you kill all the microbiome in the soil, yeah. particularly the funguses, which is really where the energy gets marshaled and made available for other plant life. You know, we don't use that stuff on our farm and we have kept over 50% of the land in forests. Beautiful. Uh, you know, for, for just those reasons. Mm. And we have, when we do use fertilizer, we use turkey shit for fertilizer. Nice. Uh, from a turkey house nearby. And it provides energy to the plants, but it also provides a tremendous boost to the, you know, the microorganisms in the soil. And our, you know, when we bought this place, it had been abused and overgrazed and all kinds of stuff for a hundred years. And there was no worms in the soil. That was a sign mm. of no health. Today, you, you put a shovel to the soil, and uh, unless it's during a drought, you pull up a, one shovel full of soil, and you probably have 10 or 20 uh, earthworms in there. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, they're part of that cycle. Uh, it's very, very important, to say the least. All right, let's move on to another topic, which is the idea of a custodial species. Again, I think this is one of these things that's calling to me that you know, I don't quite understand, but saying there's something right about this. Mm. In the book, several times uh, you talk about the fact that humans, at least at the moment, are the custodial species for the earth. Tell us about that and what does that mean? Yeah, that, well, that, that comes out of a lot of our old stories uh, from all over. You know, it's our purpose for being here. It's, um, you know, our emergence in this system has been uh, because the system had need of a custodial species, you know, for its long longevity, uh, but also to, to maintain increase within the system. So um, increase as opposed to growth. So not growing the size of the system, but increasing the relatedness within the system, all of the, con the connectivity, you know, those, those infinite combinatorials, you know, we're supposed to oversee that. And everything about everything we do is supposed to work in with that, our culture, everything else. It's not supposed to be something that's separate from nature. There isn't even supposed to be a separate concept for nature because we are nature. You know, we occupy a very important ecological niche. You know, it's not an apex niche or anything like that either. We, we have a very important ecological niche. We're supposed to be in this habitat and um, anywhere where we're not there, you might think of it as untouched wilderness, but that place will be dying because it needs us there. Those trees have evolved over a, a long time to even just need our urine. If you're not pissing on the ground in those places, th those plants will be suffering over time and you'll, you'll see dieback in places and wonder why is, the, why is there dieback happening there? And I'm looking at it and thinking, well, that needs you know, a couple of decades of people pissing there on those trees to make that place work again, you know, and to be bringing shellfish and, and things up from the coast and sitting down and camping there because, you know, those, the things that are coming in from that, you know, into that, that environment is depending on us bringing those things into it, you know, just in our cultural practice, you know, taking fish from the river and eating it there, I guess the same way with the bears and the salmon, you know, those forests need those salmon there and the bears eating the salmon off in the trees because the trees have come to depend on what's coming out of the salmon. You know, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, so I always say, like, people, tree huggers, I said, don't hug a tree. Like, if you want to help, piss on the tree. You know, the tree doesn't need your hugs. <laughs> it needs your urine, you know. Um, so do that. All these symbioses, I keep coming back to it. You know, I was thinking about the ticks earlier. Now, they only get out of control and 
and those parasites within them that create Lyme disease, etc. You know, they only get out of control when things are out of balance. It's the same, you know, with uh, all these pathogens that are created. You know, viruses are, are there for a reason. They have an evolutionary purpose. You know, they help change things at the gen genetic level and they help to bring things in balance with a constantly changing landscape. You know, that's what they're there for. I did some work for a, a company and basically what they did was they'd, they'd go whenever a, a big corporation was shamed over some terrible thing it did and wanted to um, improve its image, you know, f through philanthropic works, this company would go in and design interventions that they could do in third world countries to uh, sort of sharpen up their image a bit, you know, put in a million dollars to help this. And um, yeah, one company decided they wanted to um, uh, stop malaria in a particular place in Africa where, you know, the mosquitoes were killing a lot of people. And um, yeah, I did some consulting for that group. Ah, I really loved the solution that, that came out in the end. Was, was what they did was they fixed the river. So they, um, they removed the dam <laughs> that, had, that had caused the river to slow and stagnate, you know, and they, they cleared the, the river of all the rubbish and blockages and, um, and caused it to flow uh, clean again. And once the river was flowing as it was supposed to, the mosquito problem was gone. So rather than, ah, oh, how are we going to get, you know, all these medications, <laughs> you know, into this community and um, who's going to pay for it and all that sort of stuff. Instead, they just fixed the river and then they fixed the pathogen. They fixed the, the health problem and the malaria. And so it's, you know, it's all these imbalances. Yeah, you use that word a lot. And I think it, it, it should resonate for us if, if we're starting to think about this idea of custodial species. I'm going to play this back to you and tell me if I'm full of shit or not, is that, uh, you know, the custodial species job is actually to help fine tune the balance, right? To be a helper in the domain of the complex rather than a builder of the complicated that tries to dominate the complex. Yeah. And, you know, to adapt with change, but then also assist the system to transition in times of change as well. Yeah, and I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, it's um, it's more than a caretaker. I think a custodian is a is a it's a very deep role, and I think it's a it's a good thing for people to think about, meditate on a little bit. You know, you be surprised what might fall out of that kind of thinking. A nice way to think of ourselves too, because I mean, we're really you know we're branding ourselves badly, human beings with all our language and everything around the Anthropocene and all this sort of stuff like it's caused by human nature somehow that's in our natures to destroy all this. But it's not us doing it. It's not our community activities and, you know, our way of life or anything like that, you know. Communities aren't producing all of this waste and, and toxicities. It's the big, clunky, tinkered, complicated systems, you know, that, that have been sort of set up around us. It's all these industries, you know, these are the things that are using up all the water and creating all the waste and owning all this land and, you know, locking it off. And yeah, it's a terrible thing. You know, there's something like there's only 20% of the habitat left on the planet. And that is in dire trouble, you know, because yes, it's there's a lot of toxicity going in and out of those. So they're not unpolluted. But also in those, you know, untouched wilderness areas or, you know, natural places, you know, they're kind of like these islands of death because they're not free to exchange uncontaminated matter, you know, across between different bioregions and different systems. They're just kind of uh, surrounded pretty much like, I don't know, the U.S. military around Russia or something, you know. Yeah, completely surrounded and nothing can get in or out and... Um, yeah, so you've got all these national parks that are just slowly dying. Yeah, and these things are driven by systems upon systems. Yeah. You know, and at least in my analysis, in the West, the core system is this damn money-on-money -money return mm. where the inner loop is this drive to make money grow and in the short term, meaning less than three years. Yeah. And we have our businesses driven by that. We have our you know, frankly, our family work, you know, why do we need to have two full-time people working 40 hours a week to do what forager level people did two to four hours a day, one yeah. person? Well, I yeah. actually two people, I should take that back. It's become a cultural thing too. We're, we're all speculating on our own individual futures. 
you know, we're, we're all, we're drawing on our, our relationships and our time and our, you know, and constantly building our skills and, and all these kind of things, you know, to speculate on our personal futures. And everybody is this isolated individual trying to do that. So we're kind of, we've taken on this Ponzi scheme, you know, at the level of the cultural DNA of our everyday lives, you know, we're enacting that pattern over and over. And I guess that's that horrendous, uh, you know, narcissistic pattern again. And it's having a feedback loop that is really uh, manifesting itself in bad ways. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you talked about is avatar depression. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that for us. That was a very interesting idea. Actually. Yeah. I, I just, <laughs> it just makes me laugh, that one. <laughs> it was like I was just trying to come up with a theory as to why we had to wait for so long for a sequel to the first Avatar movie, you know? And and I figured it was like all these psychologists had to get the medication right to treat the Avatar depression. And when I read the article on that, I was just laughed and laughed that that's a real thing. Like it's a real psychological, it's a medical condition. There's people who watch Avatar and then just give up on their life because <laughs> they see, like they catch this really beautiful vision of a, of a connected, vibrant existence, you know, completely immersed, you know, in a landscape and a, a culture that has honor in it and, you know, dignity. And they, they just, they see that and then they look at their own life and they go, ah, oh, fuck, <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and so they, yeah, there was this, a lot of amotivated people and, you know, coming out of it. And uh, yeah, they had to try and figure out how to treat it because it was millions of people who were succumbing to it. And I guess they had to get the medication right before they released the sequel. Yeah. And of course, the third part, you know, we have the beautiful blue people, you know, we have our own society. Then we also, of course, have the theme of the movie, which is the mining monster mm. destroying the blue people. Yeah. Right? What the fuck are we doing, right? I can see how that, that that could rock people into a bad place. Yeah, trying to obtain the unobtainium. Yeah, unobtainium, exactly. Yeah. Right? Uh, the rat race. Yeah, my friend Brett Weinstein calls this system Goliath, right? And it's not something anybody controls. That's the interesting thing. It's a meme space entity. Meme in the Dawkins sense, not in the sense of a picture of a cat smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Uh, but it... It's a series of ideas and signals which are kind of like a standing, like a wave in a river. The wave's always there, but the water flows through and nobody actually made the wave. It's an emergent result of the action of the water. Mm. So Goliath is a uh, emergent result of our system of systems uh, with, at least in my view, money on money return at the center. But fortunately, because there is no one in charge, it means that if we can change our systems in a major way, we can maybe make Goliath be a lot less hideous than he is today. Yeah. Or just get your little sociopath kid with a slingshot to put a nice round rock between his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And there is one uh, yeah, called the called the Debt Jubilee, right? The oh, Debt yeah. Jubilee will bring down Goliath. Do you reckon that's ever, that's ever going to happen, a Debt Jubilee? I don't know. I've been keeping that stone in my sling for a number of years. Uh, and in fact, there's a very cool concept called the Jubilee Ratchet, yeah. uh, which makes it really work, which is that you threaten the Jubilee. And if you think about debt, there's uh, an interest. There's two parts of interest. One is the time value of money, right? So essentially, the call it the interest rate on a high quality government bond. Uh, governments are getting a little shakier, but in until recently, you could call it that. But the other is the risk of the investment not getting repaid, right? So mm. a person who has bad credit, they pay a higher interest rate. Well, guess what? If you start talking about the Jubilee and lots of people start talking about it and investors start believing there's at least a chance, let's say it's only a 5% chance in the next five years that the Jubilee could happen. You know what that does? That adds 1% to the interest rate for all loans. Yeah, just talking about it. <laughs> And that, just talking, it's called the Jubilee Ratchet. So yep. it's actually probably the, the biggest thing I have ever invented in my life, yeah. the Jubilee Ratchet. All you have to do, all you have to do to mess with the economy is mess with confidence. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then suppose what happens when, when it gets to 20% chance in five years. That adds 5% to the interest rate. Yeah. And what does that do? It makes more people want to have a jubilee to get this goddamn monkey off their back. Right? And that feeds back in a positive feedback loop. And eventually, Beautiful. I've done some simulations on it. And then when you get to the end game, it takes about six weeks to crush the system. Oh, my goodness. You, you need, uh, yeah. You need to deploy that. Not yet. There's a. There, I know, but that <laughs> I talk about. It's so funny. I talk about old man Juma Fijo in the book, and, and and there's a rock. There's a sacred rock in a really secret place, and he reckons if anybody ever touches that rock, like just puts their hand on it, it'll be the end of the world. <laughs> it'll be a cataclysm, <laughs> and it's just every now and then he'll be watching the news, and he go, and you just see him mutter, "I might go touch that rock." <laughs> I can understand. That. I think you're sitting on something similar there, but um, yeah, the, that would definitely do some good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, check out if you have people want to read about the Jubilee Ratchet. The early work we did before Game B was something called the Emancipation Party, and the core of the Emancipation Party was actually to deploy the Jubilee Ratchet. And it's written up in great and scary detail at emancipationparty.org. So what the hell? I'm going to sort of let it loose. I'm not going to deploy it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, no, but just let it sort of go out in spore mode into the world and see what happens. Exactly. Just, just the idea itself. You know, it's really interesting. Ideas five years ago that were crazy, like a UBI, nobody would countenance that five years ago. Now, like people are considering it quite seriously now. Yep. In fact, our Emancipation Party had a UBI in 2012. We called it the Citizenship Wage. Yeah. Where every citizen would get $10,000 a year, I think it was. And every child over four would get 5000 The word UBI didn't even exist, but we invented it. We thought it made such obvious sense. Yeah. I'm going to leap a little bit here from, you know, the modern and the tinkering and fucking and hacking with finance to more indigenous ideas. One of the things that came up again and again in the book, and for me was an eye opener, was the importance of stone and rocks in your society. In fact, I have a cool quote here. This is from Max, uh, one of the people you talked with. Stones to me are the objects that parallel all life, more so than trees or mortal things, because stones are almost immortal. They know things learned over deep time. Stones represent earth tools and spirit. It conveys meaning through its use and through its resilience to the elements. At the same time, it ages, cracking and eroding as time wears it down. But it's still there, filled with energy and spirit. Mm. Yeah. Just wrap a little bit, you know, a little on stone and its importance and how meaningful it is to your people. Yeah. It's really essential to everything. You know, I, I guess here's the thing in any uh, complex system that there is self-organization that's going on in that system. And so in in our way of looking at the world, there's knowledge in that system, that that system has knowledge and that all of its parts, all the nodes there, they connect up and they contain part of that knowledge. You know, each node in the system contains a part of that knowledge, every single entity and, you know, so a being is not just a, a human being. You know, there's also the animals, there's the plants, um, but also, you know, a whirlwind or, you know, a king tide or, a, a, you know, all these kinds of things. That these are all things that contain elements of the pattern in there, w which is knowledge. And so from that point of view, a, a rock is sentient. A rock contains knowledge. Um, a rock contains living spirit. And um, yeah, so therefore, it's something that needs to be treated with respect, especially because it's an entity that lives for so long. You can't just pick up a rock from anywhere and, and take it home with you because the spirit of that rock will, you, you don't know what the nature of that spirit is. You know, so we have lots of stories here. You know, still now you sit around the campfire, if you're talking to somebody, you know, there'll always be a story of a family member they've, they've had who's uh, done the wrong thing and picked up a rock and taken it home and ended up uh, going crazy or dying or getting tormented, you know, by spirits or, or something like this, you know. Uh, so there's this idea of very carefully approaching rocks and utilizing rocks and respecting them as, as things that contain knowledge and that are part of the system, you know. And, yeah, they're constantly being cycled, you know, through the earth and created and recreated in the same way that we are. 
And, you know, the trees that will lever them up, you know, from deep down and they bring up everything that we need for life, you know, phosphorus and all kinds of things. So, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, that it's just this idea, if you're expanding the idea of what your mind is and linking it out, you know, moving, if you, you, you can understand that haptic cognition and recognize a tool as an extension of your hand and that there's neural processes going on in that. And then you can recognize that your mind is actually going throughout your body, that there's that awareness. And then that, uh, yeah, it's also going out into the tools, the other things that you're making with that tool. So then you have an object that's separate from you. And then you come to realize that, well, the people that you're in relation to, that you're carrying knowledge in that relationship. It's not just in that person's mind or just in your mind, but the knowledge you create and share together, you're actually sharing in a relational space between you. It's that Nora Bateson's warm data, I guess. It's like that, you know, that the knowledge is in those relationships. Yeah, so you come to understand all those nodes as containing knowledge, but then you come to realize that that that's not most of the knowledge. The most of the knowledge is in the relationships between all the nodes. You know, it's in these sort of invisible lines of what we'd understand as spirit that, that goes throughout the system like that. And that is, of course, the duality of reality. We have objects and we have relationships yeah. and neither can exist by themselves. And you know, uh, reductionist science and sort of the more aberrant varieties of Western civilization focus overly on the object and forget the relationships. Yeah. And yet without the relationships, you don't have anything. Yeah, right? that's it. I could tell you a story about a particularly sentient rock. Do it. I guess I've almost been radicalized by that old man, Juma Fijo, who I, I share a lot of his symbols in the book that he wants to go out to the into the world to as many people as possible because he believes that it'll do this ritual action that'll change people at the molecular level. And man, I've even got Jim Rutt saying he feels like his DNA has been changed after seeing these things. So that must be real. There's a, there's a rock out in a bay up uh, Darwin there. And there's a beacon that's been placed on that. So it's a steel beacon that's been hammered into the rock. And um, he says that's, that's damaging a, a, a lot of things. Just that beacon being there, it's blocking the work that that rock does for us. You know, so that rock is a sentient part of that system. And, you know, the, the, the tasks that that rock does can no longer be done because of that beacon there. And um, so there's a, a blockage there of spirit. And one of the tasks that he's given me to perform in my lifetime is to somehow perform some kind of act of domestic terrorism and remove that beacon from that rock. And when I finally went out to that place to see it, I saw there's a military base like right beside it on the shore. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm not just going to get arrested for this. I'm going to get shot. (laughs) This is insane. Terrible. Yeah. So rocks are a really important part. Like they're very large rocks, big geological features, and but the small ones as well. They're a very important part of our cosmology. Uh, but see, that's getting into the spirit side of things, Jim. Ah, yeah, we'll talk. It's not your favorite. Uh, that's not your favorite business. Well, it's actually, I love <laughs> to talk about it, right? But yeah. as you know, I am well, skeptical. Well, if you, you think, of it as a, think of it as just a, a different cultural metaphor for a lot of the same things you're talking about. Yeah, that's cool. That, and that, that I understand. I'm very comfortable talking about spirit, but in... in um, you know, that's why I've, I'm a novice with complexity theory, but I've learned as many of the terms as I can so that I can use those metaphors when I speak to people because that's uh, people who are from that culture. So I want to respect them by using the metaphors of their culture to talk about, you know, we're talking about the same thing. I'm talking about spirit, but, you know, you're talking about feedback loops and, you know, we just have different metaphors for those things. And information and patterns and things yeah. like that. There is one that maybe integrates our views, right, in a, in a scientific, valid fashion. Do you know anything about Julio Tonini's uh, integrated information theory? Ooh, no, but that sounds really good. Uh, this is very eerie stuff. Some of the leading cognitive science working on the problem of what is consciousness. Christoph Koch and Julio Tonini and James Crick was involved in it also for a while. Francis Crick whatever, the the crick, the one that's not Watson from the DNA. And they actually have a mathematical formalism called uh, Integrated Information Theory, IIT, it's usually known as, Mm. that all physical objects have some level of consciousness 
And if you could do the math, which today we cannot, but we can approximate it, you can actually calculate the level of consciousness. Mm. And he starts with an example of a light switch and says uh, a light switch has approximately X consciousness, right? And a TV screen ha actually has not very much consciousness, but has a little bit, right? And guess what? A rock has quite a bit more, a hell of a lot less than an ant, but it has some. So Tonini wow. and his collaborators have a mathematical description of consciousness in everything. It's basically an integration between panpsychism and cognitive science. I would say it's well worth a look. Yeah, no, I, I definitely need to get that. Yeah, I'll send you a link uh, when we're done. It's an, uh, Please, yeah, put it in the... Uh, uh, I will say I'm, I'm a little skeptical of some of its implications, but I do think it's something we need to, to think about and talk about, right? Yeah. Yes, I famously complain about the S word, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's not the concept. I think, that, you know, when I read your book, I at first said, oh, this is going to be some moonshine and nonsense sense. Fuck this, right? Uh, then I read it. I realized we're pretty much on the same page, right? Yeah, yeah. That it's about relationships. It's about systems. It's about patterns. It's about evolution. And it really isn't necessary. In fact, you say somewhere in the book that you don't have to believe in ghosts, right? Yeah. And my form of rejection of the S word is the ghosts part. The rest of it I get and I appreciate. And I, I appreciate the fact that you explicitly called out that it's possible to get this without believing in ghosts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I mean, you can, you know, when I'm describing out the four, our four parts of spirit, you know, I mean, you don't have to call it, you know, what we call it in our various languages or, or even think of it like that. You can just quite easily have that idea of lizard brain, monkey brain, you know, et cetera, that way. You know, you, you could use any, any metaphor you like. Look, I'll talk to anybody because even the most insane ideas, you know, they'll spark thinking in different directions. So, I mean, I love talking to flat earthers. I love, I love flat earthers. So I get some of my best ideas from flat earthers. Their physics is bullshit, you know. <laughs> that you, you know, your phone is not going to work with with flat earth physics <laughs> they just they need to get some physicists and work out the math but then what a challenge what would flat earth mathematics be like what if you had to rearrange all of the physics and try and make those equations work <laughs> what if you had to just even attempting that impossible you know ridiculous you know thought experiment you might discover the next thing, you know, you, it just might lead you off in a different direction and you might find the next thing. So it's, I mean, it's always good to talk to different people and look at their ways of viewing the world. Yeah, you're a better man than I. I got no problem with flat earthers. I think get all the girls too, <laughs> flat earthers. And, uh, and, and if you want, if you want to learn about networking, you got to talk to them because they seem to have it down pat. If they could sell that shit, they could sell anything, right? Yeah. I mean, they're doing it all on machines that wouldn't work if the world was actually flat. But, um, you know, yeah, they seem to really have it down. They certainly know how to radicalize otherwise sane people pretty quickly. You know, I wouldn't mind learning how to do that. Well, yeah, uh, the, a the ability to sell total horseshit is quite a skill. Yeah. You did refute it with, I thought was a very elegant example from physical reality. He says, well, you know, maybe I'll buy uh, flat earthism when somebody shows me a flat bubble. Yeah, blow me a flat bubble. <laughs> I don't know. And of course, that, that shows an incredible knowledge, actually, of physics and chemistry and everything else, right? That, you know, a bubble is what will be formed as the most efficient in a three-dimensional world. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, but then even in just thinking about those ideas and, uh, you know, it just it occurred to me that that would be a really good solution for packaging, you know, if you could somehow have round packaging. Yeah. yeah. You could get get more volume of stuff into a smaller um, object. Yeah. yeah, surface area it minimizes the amount of surface area. And, of course, that's one of the reasons we have cans for things because they're halfway between a square and a sphere in terms of their efficiency. Yeah. On the flip side, they don't pack as well as squares. So there's tra everything is trade-offs, right? Everything's trade-offs. Yeah, that's it. Right. That's it. Uh, we're having a good time here chatting, but let's. I want to hop ahead a little bit, skip over some of these other neat little stories to some of the most important, I think, part of your work that I really make, want to make sure gets out into the world. And one of them is that you have identified a few simple operating guidelines, sustainability agents. 
basically your set of diversify, connect, interact, and adapt. I would really like to spend a little bit of time going over those four and your thoughts about what they are and why they're so important for a sustainable agent or sustainability agent that, uh, you know, is part of a system that needs to be sustainable. Yeah. Well, I came to that by like just reading about AI and I was thinking, you know, about operating protocols and things like that. And that it's always better to have one that has a few simple, you know, operating protocols and then let it loose on a field of data. And so then I was thinking about all the principles of complexity um, and all that sort of thing. And I was reading some weird libertarian economist as well, and all those kind of ideas converged. And I thought, yeah, it's just those four things, connectivity and that interaction. Uh, diversity also really important. But diversity, I really like where complexity theory took me with the definition of diversity as a principle. Because it's not this kind of PC idea of just having a few different colored faces around a table. You know, it's more than that. Diversity means m making sure you're as dissimilar as possible to the other nodes around you that are similar to you. That's the first thing. And, and I found that to be really important. You know, that you can't just cluster together in these groups where you're all just repeating each other's words. These echo chambers you see on Twitter and and, you know, in, in cyberspace now, they're, they're terrible because, you know, everybody's just having this group think. But you need that diversity where you're being dissimilar from the people you're similar to. But then you also need to be interacting constantly with, with other agents that are completely dissimilar to you. And I was thinking about that in terms of ecosystems. And I was looking at that and going, yeah, this is how all these things evolve, all these symbioses. You have to have that uh, diversity. And then that needs to be the basis for your interaction. And you have to have a constant exchange, you know, of energy, resources, matter, you know, between all these nodes. So there was that and lots of different connections. So in that, for me, that was very much based on those pronouns in our Aboriginal languages that I was talking about last week. They lined up really well with these things. Um, all the different, different kind of connections you have to have. First of all, the pairs you know, that there are pairs within a system, things that are paired together, and then there's exclusive groups, and but then there's bigger, you know, inclusive groups and the entire system as well. Yeah, I really like the way that worked. Yeah. But then, of course, the most important thing that all these lead to, and it's all for shit if you don't have the last one, but you have to have that adaptivity. You have to be able to allow yourself to be changed. A feedback loop needs to be transforming you, you know, if you're involved with it. Yeah, you can't be stagnating at all. You have to be adapting uh, constantly. So you have to allow these interactions and these exchanges of energy to change you. And I guess that's the hardest part. Yeah, that comes from, you know, very parallel to our complexity theories, concept of a complex adaptive system, right? Yeah. That truthfully, because the world is always in flux around us, right? The things outside of our semi-permeable membrane, if we can't adapt in a, to complexity you know, and in complexity and with complexity, then we're not likely to be long for the world. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, I've, I think I say in the book that our elders often say, if you don't move with the land, the land will move you. <laughs> you have to be at least as fluid as your landscape and the things that are happening within it. Yeah. And that's, I think, pretty much exactly right and exactly the same as the concept of complex adaptive systems. If you are rigid, the land is going to move or the water is going to wash you away, right? Yeah. Uh, very, you know, a reed in a river in flood is still there when the flood is over, but the bridge is often gone, right? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's very, very, very important, it strikes me. Uh, I also wanted to put another connection between your work and other work, which I always find to be interesting when I'm talking to people. When you talk about connectedness, you talk uh, specifically about it starting with pairs of people or pairs of anything, right? Yeah. And yeah, there's a very interesting concept called holarchy from Arthur Kessler's book, The Ghost in the Machine. Mm. And the idea of a holon is very closely related, which is that, and again, with the conversation we had earlier about relationships and objects. Uh, he makes the very interesting and important, and how the hell did we miss it? Western philosophy more or less missed this, is that every object, every holon, as he would call it, is both an interior and it's an exterior, 
right? Mm. So it is, for instance, a cell is interior of a tissue or an organ, but it's exterior to the chemicals dancing around inside of it. You know, a molecule is interior to a cell, but it's exterior to the atoms that are inside of it. Mm. And uh, you can go down at least to quarks and the philosophy there would say is probably a bunch of levels below quarks. And we have no idea how high you can go because like the human is in a pair with a, with say a spouse or a best friend. And those people are in relationship with a larger group. And in, we were talking before the show about hollow chain. Well, guess where the hollow comes from? It comes from hallmark. So the hollow chain philosophy is actually uh, based upon this idea of holons and the fact that everything is both an interior and an exterior, depending on where it is in the emergent relationships. Yeah. Ah, man. And and, and it's just the hollow chain is such an elegant idea. You know, if only the the clunky tech would actually allow it to be efficient, it would be amazing. Yeah, I did a podcast recently with Art Brock on the kind of t- nerdy technical details of Holochain because I, I have fallen in love with it. Yeah. And we'll be, do- be doing another with him soon at a much higher level, easier to understand on what Holochain as a principle can let us do, with, re- especially with respect to things like uh, creating distributed currency. Yeah. You know, we talked about the money on money return machine. You know, the problem is there's only one signal. Make my money grow, motherfucker, right? Yeah, that's it. And from that, all the sins of the world, almost, not all, but a bunch of them can be derived. But suppose there were currencies for, for instance, the preservation of that river you talked about, Mm. right? And anybody that fucks up the river loses that currency, right? And anybody that makes that river healthier gains that currency. And so the river has its own currency. Yeah. And so every action that's taken that impacts the river is signaled thumbs up or thumbs down by the river currency. We could just take the Chinese software for social credits and do ecological credits instead. How does that work? It's got to be decentralized. <laughs> it has to be uh, adaptive. Yeah. No goddamn top down. Yeah, I mean, that's the, it. the Chinese are building the most complicated society ever. Yeah. Right. Uh, they are, and, and, and no surprise, on the Politburo, I think uh, eight of the 10 members are engineers, right? Not scientists, but engineers. Yeah. And so the Chinese have decided to go all in on complicated. They're going to design it top down and they're going to use brute force and they're going to use murder and torture and brainwashing mm. and uh, everything else to have their way and their social credit system, which initially sounds interesting. I believe is implemented by the way they're doing it is a fucking nightmare. It's, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's 1984 plus 1984 done right. Yeah. You know, if you were, the, if you were big brother, uh, you'd like to have all the tools that the Chinese have at their, at their yeah. hands today. So well, it's like being, it's like being canceled on Twitter, except you lose all your money as well. Yeah. And your ability to travel and probably your friends stop talking to you and everything yeah, else. Right. <laughs> Horrifying. Uh, so horrifying. Yeah. The worst. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, when I talk about the bad basins of attraction in my essay, uh, In Search of the Fifth Attractor, I specifically lay out the Chinese neo-fascist is perhaps the worst that we could fall into. Yeah. Though it's a race between that and fundamentalist religion, in my opinion. Both of them are pretty fucked up. But something like Holochain, which would allow many competing signal currencies to be adapted by people locally, and if they get adherence, they start to do their thing. If they don't, people just ignore them, then they go away. And that's the way it needs to be. Bottom up and emergent, not top down and just crushing everybody's soul. Yeah, that's it. Well, I, you know, I mean, you, you did say that, the, you know, there is only one signal at the moment, and that's the money on money return thing. But I think there's a lot of competing signals starting to get out there, you know, decentralizing, uh, you know, kind of philosophies that are I think those signals are playing quite well at the moment. I, I agree. They're starting to, yeah. but, they're, but they're teeny, teeny, right? Our game B theory or uh, regenerative ecology, people like Joe Brewer, and Daniel Christian Wall. Mm. Uh, these are very interesting and very different ways of thinking about the world, but 
at least in terms of, at least in the advanced West, I don't think we're at 0.1% yet of impact on the system, but the seeds are there, yeah. which is the important thing. And from a little seed, a, a vast oak tree can grow. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, most people would have heard of Bit- Bitcoin at least. Yeah. And most people have heard blockchain and they've heard these things. Yeah. And, you know, and it's the ideas, it's the cultural ideas that start to seep into people's norms. You know, the more these conversations are had and the more interactions go on, you start to see people um, starting to just move towards this idea of we don't need these bosses. We don't need these centralized authorities. We need things better distributed, all of these systems. Truthfully, I can go on for hours on why I don't like Bitcoin and think it's actually worse than the current system. Energy intensive thing is just. It's just so many bad things. Yeah, I run my I house for two on years now. on the electricity to make one fucking Bitcoin. Yeah, anyway, yeah. oh God, the arguments we have in my house about that, you know. It sounds like. It sounds my, like my, my woman's doing a PhD, like I said earlier, on um, to you uh, on on Bitcoin and indigenous knowledge. Uh, not Bitcoin, blockchain and indigenous knowledge. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not allowed to say the H word, which is holochain. She gets wild. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, now, now, here's an interesting quote from your book. Which I love that uh, it actually fits in exactly with what we just talked about, which is, and this is actually your word, the most remarkable thing about Western civilization is its ability to absorb any object or idea, alter it, sanitize it, rebrand it, and market it. Even ideas that are a threat can be co-opted and put to work. The Romans did it with Christianity, an ideology of the poor and enslaved that threatened the foundations of empire. When torture and murder became ineffective as deterrence, they simply embraced the idea and made it the state religion. Maybe this ability of Western civilization, more than any other previous civilization to adapt to anything, might actually be our salvation. Yeah. Or maybe not. But... It seems to adapt things, it, but it, I mean, it just adopts the branding of the things. That's the problem. You know, it takes the shell and throws everything meaningful away. So it takes on the branding and the labels of these things and uh, makes people feel happy that, yeah, we're doing this, you know? Yeah, we're, I don't know, airbrushing all this with this politically correct language now, but still the same systems of imbalance and inequity and oppression. You know, it's it's this this kind of embracing of any idea that could uh, destroy the system and just taking on the language of it and the images of it and um, turning it to support the status quo. Though on the other hand, there are things that are like viruses, right? The Western civilization has taken in, as you pointed out, some of these radical ideas like blockchain. Yeah. And it may eat it from inside. Yeah. Well, it'll, it'll turn it, it, and it already is. They're already turning blockchain into something else. They're finding ways to, like banks are embracing it and getting on board with it and trying to find ways to, um, you know, the stock market, everything else, trying to find ways to incorporate it into the money on money return paradigm. So they'll take it, you know, and they'll go, yeah, decentralized, but they won't be. They won't actually do that. They'll just say, they'll just call it that. Uh, but it'll still be the same Ponzi scheme, just with a different name. And it lo- running more efficiently, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like the IBM blockchain platform, you know, blockchain for game A motherfuckers, right? Yeah. <laughs> and highly optimized and lots of capabilities. But, you know, again, the idea is now loose. One of my uh, things that really bothers me about uh, having to raise the consciousness of people is that our monetary system in the West did not come down from Mount Sinai with Moses, right? It was a series of frozen accidents starting uh, with the Greeks and, you know, going through the establishment of the Bank of England in 1694, where we, for the first time, had central banks with fractional reserve currency, Mm -hmm. you know, the Federal Reserve going off the gold standard. This monetary system is not a given. It is a series of frozen accidents and we can change it, Mm -hmm. right? And if we change the monetary system or have competing monetary systems, then that fundamental engine at the center becomes a quite different beast. And it's possible that the West's avidness to absorb any object or idea, as you put it, could well have it absorb, have, may already have absorbed this virus of decentral bottoms up self-organizing signals in a way that may allow the bottom to capture the top. Yeah, I wonder. Well, I think that'd be a nice way to look at it. 
a, a nice hopeful note to end on. But I think usually it will be like dream catchers, you know. People like to hang them off the rearview mirror of their car or hang them up around their house as, as decorations, but they have no idea about um, – how those things are used in cultural context in Native American culture. They have no idea about the law and the stories around that. They don't know about the protocols of that and, and all of the social norms attached to that and how you're supposed to behave with those things. They just have them hanging on the wall, you know, so they embrace the dream catcher, but they're still having the same shitty dreams. And that's exactly right. And in fact, in our Game B discussion, we use uh, something so similar, it's uncanny, which is our biggest risk is that we accidentally reinvent Game A with just Game B terminology. Yeah. Well, I think you have a bigger risk, which is all the good stuff that you produce gets um, stolen from you by <laughs> Game A people who then <laughs> call what they're doing game B and they use all your terminologies and everything, but basically um, use that to maintain their monopolies. Yeah. It's like greenwashing on an environmentalism, right? Yeah. And they, they use some of your solutions to, you know, be able to kick the can down the road a bit further. Yeah. I'm sure people will try. Yeah. Well, Tyson, I want to again say that your book is the most meaningful book I have read in years, uh, and that's Sand Talk. And I would strongly encourage all people who want to try to reach towards what comes next, whether it's Game B, whether it's something entirely else, to read this book and see if you can feel it in your DNA trying to tell you something. I'm not yet sure what it's trying to tell me, but I know it's trying to tell me something. And uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, marinating on this uh, for some time to come. And I certainly look forward to talk to you again. Just just let it work on you, Jim. You, you don't have to be even conscious of it. Just <laughs> just keep going and doing what you're doing. It's, it's magnificent and beautiful. Keep uh, gaming the bee. Exactly. It's working for me. I'm loving it. Ah, great, great chatting with you, and I look forward to chatting with you again in the not-too-distant future. Sweet. See you, Jim. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.